you go straight. <laughs> so we're talking to Chief Executive of Telecom New Zealand, and um, now we're going to get into the, some of the specifics of, of product and USB and, and all this sort of stuff. And um, we'll get nitty gritty of the services and technologies. So, how do you think USB is going at the moment? I mean, there's problems. Uh, look, I think we're still early days in, um, in you know, it, look, it, it took us 150 years to roll out and, and successfully use the copper network, so I'm not surprised that it's taken yeah. a wee while to figure out how to maximise the processes and, uh, and get the benefits from, uh, from the UFB program. We, um, we, we're well underway. What, what I can say is customer demand is very good, so it's not, it's not, we're not finding it difficult to sell. The challenges are mostly on the supply side. It's still, there is a lot of learning, and we're principally dealing with chorus at the moment. Our systems are not yet able to connect with the, uh, with the other LFCs. We're close to that. We're about to start uh, with, with the others. Uh, the others are relatively small. Anyway. That's the, well, they are thirty percent of North Zealand. Power, and, yeah, there's and three and other and Christchurch. Yeah. Um, but and uh, Christchurch. But we're very keen to get on with them. So it's just that our systems were always linked to Chorus. So that was where we were already joined up. We've been having to build the capability to connect with the operating systems of uh, of the other three fiber companies. But we're not far away from that. We're within months now of of getting going, and I think we're within, a, a, you know, literally within one or two months of getting under a meaningful trial. So, so I'm pleased with consumer demand, um, but we are still all struggling with the capacity and the complexity of getting a fibre connected and up and running. Those processes are still clunky. So, I mean, one of the key issues here is that when they modelled the separation, they thought the cost of connection was going to be somewhere between three or four hundred dollars per house. And on that basis they assumed that that the um, that chorus's share of the revenue would be sort of thirty five dollars per month per connection. And that, that would somehow that would pay for pay for those connection costs. Actual costs are running way over, way higher than that, sort of in excess of a thousand, maybe twelve hundred, thirty, forty hundred dollars. How big of an economic problem is that? I genuinely do not know the answer to that. So I, I and I don't have any of those facts. So mm. you know, I, I would suspect certainly today that the cost would be above the long run view. But they're still in the learning process. So you know, I, if, if I were at Chorus, I'd be, I'd still be figuring, well, you know, how do we learn every day from what what was the best the best ways to get a connection done. Mm. So I'm sure they'll be resolute. You think about about bringing down in that cost. I, I would expect so, but whether it's sold, whether it ever matches what they're planning or business case, I, I don't know because I don't know what the assumptions were. And I wasn't here at the time of separation, uh, and I'm assuming I've never gone and looked back, so I don't know the answer to that. But I, in the end, um, they've got a contract. Uh, they're obliged to make those connections uh, free of charge to New Zealanders and they're obliged to meet certain service standards and, uh, and we're relying on that because we're a retailer and we've got customs on the end of these transactions and, uh, and you know the worst thing I could possibly do is encourage our best customers to take these new services and then for them to have a, a poor or delayed experience and we're not on for that. So our expectation is chorus and all the fibre companies that they will perform to their contract. And we're happy with the contract too. It's, you know, we yeah. don't need those made better, we just need them delivered against. Yeah, so I mean, this, this, we're going to talk about regulatory policy around that a little bit later. Um, but in the meantime, you're putting a bit of a focus on, on the VDSL product and um, you're calling it ultra, yeah. ultra broadband. Yeah. Le less so a focus, more just, it, it is apparent, all our market testing showed that customers have the appetite for Fast. speed and quality, which is fantastic, we're in the business of providing that, and, uh, and you know, particularly video based, you know, more and more intense use of high, high data applications means the demand for speed is impressive, well, that's good, it's good for customers to get it, it's good for our business to deliver it. So the challenge for us with fibre alone, 
if we focus only on fibre as a solution is that is there's you know still very low coverage of this low availability uh, it, it's challenged so so how do you market you run an advert you know 95 percent of the people who rang and said i'd like to take the product we then have to say well i'm sorry it's not available that that's hopeless so so by combining the concept of faster copper using BDSL and fibre uh, as a single idea allows us to do mass marketing and just be able to say yes to most customers when they ring in and they'd say they like that service. That is a that is a much better way for us to do business and and there's no doubt in our, our mind in the end, you know, fibre's the most desirable product. So we don't have an issue that once fibre is available that most customers who take BDSL will of course want to upgrade them to fibre so and we'll be happy to help. There's been massive um, competitive changes in the in the in the broadband market. I mean, data caps are much higher, speeds are much higher. Um, the last two years have seen a very, very competitive market there. Do you see that pricing data caps and services market in the broadband area continuing to evolve rapidly? Uh, look, I don't actually. I think it's um, it p potentially around how data caps evolve, but there's a couple of parameters that start to look like limiters. Um, if you think about the current price point, less GST, so the typical standard family plan now is around $75. Uh, X GST, call it 65 Including 45 of it is paying, is but going to chorus. So there's actually only $20. Uh, in the middle of that equation today, which is providing all the internet connectivity, all of the networking, all of the all of the uh, uh, international connectivity, all of the help desk, all of the service. So th th that's that's the amount retailers have got in the equation, and there's a lot of cost associated with that. So that's why I referred to it before as a profit-free zone. It's yeah. actually that's not. Why it's pretty there. hard to make money at seventy-five dollars. I think you'll find most retailers would say if they're making a dollar, it's not much. It'll be less than a dollar. So, so that that is the reality of that price point. I think what you can, what we, what we're looking to see is that you know as people move up in speed, that maybe there's we can gain some uh, uh, some benefit from that as providers, but it will shift us more upstream into one of the content and services. Why we're interested in. Subscription television services and things like that. So it's tough to make money at seventy-five dollars on broadband. So does that mean that there's a? I mean, we the mobile revolution, mobile data is clearly centred to, to, to where change is coming from. Is that more of a focus for innovation or for pricing change or for? Yeah. Yeah. Look, we see we see mobile, particularly with four G. Four G improves the economics of delivering. Uh, delivering gigabytes via cellular, uh, but it doesn't bring it anywhere near the economics of, of fix, so it's irrelevant to a lower volume household or to an area which is stressed in terms of the fixed economics, so therefore in the, in the, in the more rural or less populous areas mm. where the cost per customer of the fixed access increases dramatically because there's low customer density, mobile cellular data delivery solution becomes a very real competitive play. So that's where the 700 megahertz digital dividend spectrum 4G is an anchor and you know our view is you know that that spectrum needs to be made available soon at modest cost so we can rapidly deploy uh, at scale genuine fast broadband because 4G will run as fast as the low spec fibre products are, uh, you know, the lower spec fibre, you know, 4G will do at least that performance in rural. So it is a, it's a game changer for rural New Zealand. So we're very keen to see it move there. And in, in the more urban areas, you know, the, the cellular data combined with Wi-Fi provides the on the move. Uh, you know the, the mobile aspect, and and becomes a genuine substitute for a low volume consumer. So you know if, if you're a consumer who just does email and a little bit of social media or something, you're not really a big video watcher. Or whatever, absolutely, cellular. You know maybe your answer. May you may not require a fixed uh, access anymore. 
So there's, there's this tension between the pace of innovation and the cost of, of services. And we've always had scale issues in New Zealand because we're, we're a little bit small and we're quite spread out. And I mean, it's been suggested to me by some people in the industry that, I mean, and you just mentioned it yourself in relation to the 4G spectrum, that if that 4G spectrum were, were made available at a, price, at a price angle which was not exorbitant, then you could have a different path of innovation that could be flow on top of that. And in fact, somebody even suggested that, that the, the spectrum could be granted for free to the major carriers in equal quantities to be truly disrupted. Market. I mean, do you have a view on whether the government ought to be thinking more laterally about how it speeds up or en enables the technological innovation to, 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 to be cost effective? Is it? Look, so I, I just really think there's a trade off, right? You can, you can push for a very high price for the spectrum. We, you know, ourselves and Vodafone are public listed companies. We operate inside CapEx envelopes. Vodafone will have their capital envelope set by the Vodafone Group in the UK. I'm a pub, we're a public company. We operate inside a manageable envelope that our investors are uh, accepting in terms of the financial terms. Two degrees uh, is is an, a startup business with a you know with with constrained access to capital. So clearly, the more the more the government wants for the spectrum, the less is in the kitty for the rollout of the utilisation of the spectrum. So there's a balancing act, and all we've said is, you know, look, we accept in the end it's the government's prerogative how it does this, but the truth, and it is the truth, it's not just a, it's, it's just, it's genuinely not just a line to uh, self-serving, but the truth is, you know, if it's put through at a modest price, it balances, I don't know, taxpayer, Mm. Taxpayer interests relative to consumers' interests, uh, an appropriate pricing enables us to apply that cash to the rollout and the use, and that's that's all we're really asking. And potentially to run to run a program which is gets a sensible outcome and puts gets that spectrum doing what it really can do, which is make a game-changing move for the less populous areas of New Zealand. That is, that's the critical outcome. There's also the LTE devices. I mean, we're going. I mean, the, I mean, the latest devices are LTE already, 4G capable. I mean, pretty soon, if we don't have 4G fast, we will be behind. I mean, yeah. we will. We will have a. We will be a step behind the rest. Well, of the they'll world. be okay in urban New Zealand because we can and, and we we can and are building an 1800 meter. So we can in, in urban we can get by for a while while the while the volume use is not too high on 1800 on our current yeah. spectrum and Vodafone have already started there and we're, we're only a, month, you know, a short while away from uh, from coming to market with that and I'm sure two degrees can do that too but in the end the 700, the economics of 700 are sort of substantially yeah. superior and that's where you'll get large scale coverage and certainly the reach into the less populous areas which is just not possible economically on 18 it would be, it's just not possible. Now, urban Wi-Fi is another part of, part of this. Um, I mean, London is now completely Wi-Fi enabled, free Wi-Fi everywhere, and proper, I mean, secure Wi-Fi. Is that, I mean, that's an area that I understand you guys are looking at as well. Well, we're, we're currently deploying, and you can see our Wi-Fi zone yeah. uh, uh, logos all around the, uh, um, Built-up areas of New Zealand, the holiday spots, the yeah. the you know the, the terminal area, people where people are on the pause. Um, uh, we use our uh, payphone network extensively for hotspots. Okay, so we we see Wi-Fi as part of an integrated proposition that just helps uh, for our customers have their anywhere, anytime, economically acceptable experience. Not everyone can afford to fork out for piles of cellular data and dark cellular data is more expensive to deliver than 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 um, time. So what we, we see Wi-Fi data is cheaper. We see yeah that's what I'm getting yeah. at. So 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 we see uh, the all data world, you know, providing connectivity as a combination of copper, fibre, Wi Fi 
and cellular and in, in a way as seamlessly as possible. The protocols don't currently enable hand off completely, but as seamlessly as possible for people to have, and as, as the protocols improve, we'll embed them and, and, and adjust that. But you know, we, we're, we buy into the Wi-Fi strategy, we, and we're building it right now. And, and you're the, building it in a yeah. secure fashion as well, which, we, is, which is safe. But yep, we'll be building it in a, a way that telecom customers are authenticated to it, and it's, you know, it's a closed and safe service. Um, a key part of the picture in terms of the future of internet relativity is content. Sky is still pretty dominant in that space, although they're coming off the boil and you can see their share price is indicating that the market doesn't think they're going to remain dominant. Where do you see the challenges coming from? I think the challenge, um, it's, it's, it's no different from the challenge music companies have faced in the past or you know, the CD industry yeah. or, or you know, the newspaper or media industry is facing today um, or outlets so that, that, that the, the network uh, the network of things and the capacity of it and the fast data capability of it means that the time is now for a large amount of video content to be able to be accommodated via the internet or via networks and uh, in the past, that has never, you know, when I left here four years ago, it wasn't really feasible. It was, it was, it would just, it would have been way more expensive to deliver TV and movie content via the internet then than it is to distribute it via satellite or or uh, or terrestrial um, uh, broadcast capability. Today, the economics are close, so it's a real issue now, and therefore the models for content delivery are going to profoundly change over time. And I think the Sky is no different to any other business has to adapt to a changing delivery mechanism now. Sky would say it's in the content business, not the delivery business anyway. So I'm sure uh, that the team at Sky will just start to adopt internet-based delivery models as part of its proposition. And uh, and all that will happen is they'll face new competitors. In, you know, like Coliseum one. is a good example recently of one turning up in New Zealand, but Apple TV's been offering movies while, yeah. in New Zealand for a while, and YouTube's been yeah. pumping video through the internet for several years, and so Microsoft that's life. just the new way of the world. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing is global, global mode. I mean, essentially opening up some of the big US services to all big European services to New Zealand customer access. Now, the legal questions around that don't seem to be that. I mean, it doesn't actually seem to be, if you're paying for the content, it, although it may not be what the distributors want and it may not be in accordance with their contract contracts. Um, I mean, global mode's now being offered and by some telecommunications providers. Yeah, yeah I, look, I'm not au okay with all of the law yeah. and whether they're taking some risk or breaching things, but, but clearly digital rights, the geographic digital rights, uh, going to be an issue that, that content owners around the world are going to deal with over time. And so typically uh, typically they they are the reason why New Zealand doesn't have some mm. of the services that are available. It's not a technology issue for you know Apple TV last time I looked still doesn't offer television programs mm. in New Zealand as it does in the USA. It's not because Apple TV can't do it in, in New Zealand technologically. It is just they haven't acquired the rights yeah. to do those things in New Zealand. So, so digital rights, I think the whole process will move and adapt quite quickly to it, and you won't need all these tricky, tricky moves to circumvent them. Content providers will want their content consumed all over the world, and they'll sort out with various providers the rights to do it. And that's again, you know, the music industry early on, you you know, you couldn't get some music content because it was today you can get it all from multiple providers. So that, that'll all change quite quickly. Thank you. What did the boss say? <laughs>